this is the first um let me get this long name right hayek program department of social policy behavioral public policy seminar of this year um i think you all know the format because most of you have been to one of these before um but i'll just remind you because we've added i've added i've tried to add one little extra piece to the formula this year just because um as i said a moment ago i'm hoping that we can use these videos as a form of posterity in a way so what i'm going to ask speakers to do um before they start on their main presentations and i've sort of i'll get i've got the agreement of the speakers to do this <laughs> in advance is that they're going to just speak for just a couple of minutes maybe three or four minutes or so on you know what attracted them why did they get into sort of behavioral studies broadly defined to begin with and you know why they've remained in the field and they'll do that for four or five minutes uh, is the plan and then we'll move over to the normal format whereby uh, the person leading the seminar that week speaks for about 15 minutes or so on a topic of their choosing and then we hand over the rest of the time for uh, for discussion from the floor and questions from the floor so uh, you know, it goes without saying that it's always an honour to to have Cass um, lead these discussions, and Cass has volunteered to give the first one this year, um, which is great. He's going to be speaking about uh, why he is a liberal, uh, and without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to you, Cass. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, in terms of getting into behavioral economics as a young law professor at the University of Chicago, I was deeply skeptical of the neoclassical views that were uh, in the atmosphere. Gary Becker and George Stigler were prominent presences at the law school, and Richard Posner was in some ways an acolyte and the uh, founder really of economic analysis of law, which was based on uh, neoclassical assumptions. My own uh, skepticism was both intense and clueless, so engaging with them on various about how people would react to contract law or tort law. I thought they were not right, but I had only my literary background and I had no tools with which to interrogate their assumptions. They were uh, both theoretically very disciplined and also impressively empirical. And I really learned a ton from that. Becker would always say in response to a claim of any kind, and what's the evidence? And he would say it with a combination of uh, curiosity and, uh, uh, and almost religion. And that was uh, fantastic to see. Stigler, by contrast, was uh, a bully and also brilliant and uh, uh, formidable to discuss these matters with. Um, I was playing squash one day, this is relevant, at the University of Chicago, and I was working on a paper on departures from perfect rationality and pre-commitment strategies and preferences being endogenous rather than fixed and firm. And I mentioned this to an economist lawyer named Steve Chevelle, who was and remains one of the leading economic analysts of law. And there in the locker room, Chevelle said, well, your paper sounds really terrible and doomed, and it's uh, uh, an awful thing that you're working on it. There's someone else who's working on something similar who's uh, also terrible, and his name is Richard Thaler and he's at Cornell and he's uh, awful and you might wanna read his terrible work. And I didn't know how to spell Thaler. I thought it was T-H-A-Y-L-O-R. So it took me a while to find his 1981 paper taught a, toward a positive theory of consumer choice. I did and it was like there was an explosion in the, uh, uh, celebratory explosion in the sky of uh, a sunburst because he was you know, well beyond where I was with my paper. And uh, that led me to Kahneman and Tversky. And I read the prospect theory paper and the heuristics and biases paper and was basically off to the races. I wrote a note to Thaler when he was at Cornell, basically a, a, a fanboy note and he didn't respond, but he remembered it. And shortly thereafter he came to Chicago and he was working on a paper on behavioral economics and law with an economist lawyer named Christine Joles. I was very excited about that. I was writing an analogous paper myself. Um, they were so um, 
uh, fantastic and so, in my view, dilatory. Uh, that is, they weren't producing their paper that I said, if you don't do this, then I'm completely going to. And uh, mine won't be as good as yours, but it will be. And I'm not sure if yours will be. And Thaler then said, well, why don't you join us? And that's that's really got what got me started. Uh, we did a paper called A Behavioral Approach to Law and Economics. And kind of the heart of libertarian paternalism is, uh, is visible in the last section where we have the discussion of anti-anti-paternalism. We weren't on to libertarian paternalism for a few years, but that that was really how I started. Great, thanks for that, Cass. Um, you know, it's, uh, as I said earlier, a moment ago, I mean, the purpose really is that I think a lot of people don't, you know, know why people um, got into got into this field. Uh, even with people like you, who are so prominent within the field. So I thought that that might be a nice way of. Um, you know, sort of recording people's memories, if you like, of how they they entered the field. Maybe there'll be a bit of motivated reasoning going on as well, right? <laughs> people thinking back and sort of, you know, almost sort of imagining scenarios that got them into the field. Um, I'm not saying that's the case with you, of course, but no, it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to remember, isn't it, exactly why you... Everything to. I described is as vivid as if it were this morning. The long, oh, okay. long discussion with Steve Chevelle. I remember he was standing. I remember Thalor. I remember his skepticism. My paper was published, actually. It's called Legal Interference with Private Preferences. That was the paper that was before I really knew, knew Thaler, but I knew something about uh, the endogeneity of preferences and pre-commitment strategies. That, that, that paper came out. And then the uh, discussions with Thaler are are very vivid for me. I did a tiny paper called Behavioral Analysis of Law that preceded, I think, the paper with uh, Thaler and Joel's. And that was, you know, I also formed a collaboration with Danny Kahneman around the same time. But it was really Thaler's 1981 paper that uh, got me thinking there's a, a mine and there's a lot of gold in it. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for that. Um, so now we'll move on to the main sort of business of today, if you like, uh, and I'll hand over to you again, Cast on uh, you telling us why you're a liberal. OK, so um, this needs a little preface that there's around the world on the right uh, enthusiasm for post-liberal and anti-liberal stuff. And on the left, there's something quite similar. Uh, some of this engages with behavioral science, uh, some of it doesn't, but it's a little bit like a vanguard on both the left and the right. Um, there's a sense on the part of many that liberalism is exhausted and done, and around the world, the anti-liberal sentiments, of course, are getting traction. There's also in our field, I think, um, a lack of clarity about what liberalism is. And actually the question of how to say what it is, is uh, not straightforward. Um, and so I wrote for about six months, maybe something that I never thought I'd publish or talk to anyone about, which was a play on Hayek's Why I Am Not a Conservative. It was called Why I Am a Liberal. And uh, the paper, as I wrote it just to myself on my computer, got more and more fiery. And uh, as the fire started to light up my computer, I thought, well, maybe this isn't just for me. And I sent it to some people. And they thought you really need to do something with it. So the the paper is not what I really like to do. What I really like to do is have an empirical finding that's either a result of a collaboration or uh, something that I was lucky enough to uh, to find, or uh, an idea, a concept that is an inroad to something. And the findings and the inroads that's. My, what I like best, th those are typically small. If they work, there's a universe in a grain of sand. Um, so the smallness is not discouraging. It's, it's what you can build something out of. But what you're about to hear goes big. 
Um, it's not about a finding or a um, or an idea that's an inroad into some problem. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do, I've struggled a lot about how to do this. I think I'm just going to talk through the paper and end after 15 minutes. So at 8.26, I'm going to stop, maybe a little earlier. Uh, liberals prize freedom, autonomy, personal security, pluralism, and opportunity for all. They believe in the rule of law. They believe not only in democracy, but in deliberative democracy, an approach that combines a commitment to reason giving in the public sphere with a commitment to accountability. Deliberative democracy has been elaborated most uh, clarifyingly by Jürgen Habermas. Liberal authoritarianism is an oxymoron because liberals believe in freedom and pluralism. They reject authoritarianism in all its forms. Illiberal democracy is illiberal, hello Hungary, and liberals oppose it for that reason. Understood in this way, liberalism consists of a set of commitments in political theory and political philosophy. Those in the United States, in Europe, in South America, and Asia, who consider themselves to be conservatives, may or may not embrace liberal commitments. You can be at once a liberal, as understood here, and a right-winger. You can be a leftist and illiberal. There are illiberal conservatives and illiberal, illiberal leftists. Abraham Lincoln was a liberal. Here's what he said in 1854. If a Negro is a man, is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself? When the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is despotism. No man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. I say this is the leading principle, the sheet anchor of American republicanism. We might change the term American republicanism to liberalism. The idea of a sheet anchor is a useful way of linking self-government in people's individual capacities with self-governance as a political ideal. Liberals especially like this, no man is good enough to govern another man without, without that other's consent. They can embrace that proposition while having disparate views about the right attitude toward longstanding traditions or the proper approach to smoking, abortion, immigration, artificial intelligence, and climate change. Liberals see people as subjects, not objects, and they prize the idea of agency. For that reason, they see Mill's great work, The Subjection of Women, as helping to define the essence of liberalism. They think that Mill's argument is more than compatible with Lincoln's remarks on slavery. They insist, therefore, on a link between their commitment to liberty and a particular conception of equality, which can be seen as an anti-caste principle. If some people who are, sub are subjected to the will of others, we have a violation of liberal ideals. Liberals are committed to free and fair elections. They work to defend freedom of conscience, the right of privacy, economic opportunity, and the right to be different. They applaud Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. for embracing the principle of free thought, not free thought for those who agree with us, but free them for the thought that we hate. They agree with Justice Robert Jackson, who said that compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. Liberals are aware that all over the globe, liberalism is under siege. They see Stalin, Mao, and Hitler as defining practitioners of anti-liberalism. They regard Karl Marx and Carl Schmitt as defining anti-liberal theorists. Carl Schmitt, by the way, is having a moment. That's deplorable. They regard Putin, Orban, and Trump as contemporary anti-liberals. They know that prominent anti-liberals of various kinds are easy to find in Europe and the United States. 
Liberals believe that freedom of speech is an essential way of making self-government real. They understand that form of freedom to encompass not only political speech, but also music, the arts, including cinema and literature. They insist on that point. They agree with Robert Jackson's further claim that those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. Freedom of religion is fundamental to liberalism. This is a point for anti-liberal Catholicism, which is on the march. Liberals believe that people should be allowed to worship in their own way or not at all. Many liberals have deep religious convictions and they're acutely aware that all over the world, people of faith abhor the idea of separating church and state and insist that government should embrace and even enforce certain religious commitments. Liberals want to make the state free from domination from any particular religion, and they seek to ensure that the state guarantees safety for religion. Liberals think that any intrusion on the freedom of religious believers must be presumed to be unacceptable, though of course no one is allowed to commit acts of violence, murder, rape, or assault. If post-liberals or anti-liberals insist on an official religious orthodoxies, or orthodoxy, liberals respond, will respond, who do you think you are, God? The idea of the rule of law is central to liberalism because it reflects a belief that no one is entitled to govern another without consent. It is closely connected with Lincoln's sheet anchor. The idea entails a commitment to seven principles, clear, general, publicly accessible rules laid down in advance, law that is prospective rather than retroactive, conformity between law on the books and law in the world, rights to a hearing, some degree of separation between those who make the law and those who interpret the law, no unduly rapid changes in the law, and no contradictions or palpable inconsistency in the law. Some anti-liberals are now urging that the separation between those who make the law and those who interpret the law is not fundamental to the rule of law on the ground that it's a relatively new idea. Liberals who believe in progress and um, not backward looking um, uh, bows of the head uh, uh, are willing to insist that the separation between those who make the law and those who interpret it is fundamental to liberalism. The, the rule of law is not the same as a commitment to freedom of speech, free markets, freedom of religion, contrary to Hayek's deeply confused, inspiring, but deeply confused discussion of rule of law. It's what was just described. It has nothing, zero, nada, zed, to do with free markets. Sorry, admired Hayek. Liberals do prize free markets, not as part of the rule of law, but as an independent idea on the ground that they provide an important means by which people exercise their agency. Liberals abhor monopolies, public or private, on the ground that they are highly likely to compromise freedom. Consider consumers, workers, employers, and investors. Liberals don't forget that markets can fail, as for example, when workers or consumers lack information or when consumption of energy produces environmental harm. Can socialists be liberals? That's a complicated question. Liberals firmly believe in the right to private property. They think on grounds of autonomy and welfare, that right is really important. At the same time, nothing in liberalism forbids a progressive income tax or is inconsistent with large scale redistribution from rich to poor. Some liberals admire Lyndon Baines Johnson's great society. Some liberals really don't. Many liberals are Kantians. They insist that they should be treated as ends, not means. They are liberals because they are Kantians. In 
the world of behavioral economics, Doug Bernheim has strong Kantian sympathies, says people are allowed to make choices because it's their lives. After all, that has a Kantian flavor. Some liberals are utilitarians seeking to maximize social welfare. They are li liberals because, the, because they are utilitarians. Many liberals known as contractarian as contractarian as contractarians find it useful to emphasize the idea of a social contract between free and equal persons. Uh, Professor Sugden, my friend and one of my heroes on the line right now, uh, is in that category. They are liberals because they are contractarians. Far from seeing a conflict between liberalism and, and their faith, many people believe that their religious tradition compels or is compatible with liberalism. Liberals are able to take their own side in a quarrel, contrary to Robert Frost. Liberals like laughter. They are anti-anti laughter. Though liberals like liberalism, they do not like tribalism. These words written before events of the last weeks are that liberals tend to think that tribalism is an obstacle to mutual respect, peace, and productive interactions. They're really uncomfortable with the discussions that start, I am an X and you are a Y, and that proceed accordingly. Skeptical of identity politics, liberals insist that each of us has many different identities and that it is usually best to focus on the merits of issues, not or one on one or another identity. To liberals, a constant or excessive emphasis on a single aspect of identity tends to separate and calcify people and to endanger productive discussions. They all also believe that an insistence on identity is associated with fascism. Liberals hope that people with diverse backgrounds and views can embrace liberalism. Many liberals enthusiastically support John Rawls' idea of an overlapping consensus in which people accept the broad principles of what Rawls calls political liberalism. Political liberalism is meant to accommodate people with different views about fundamental matters and is meant to support liberalism from the right and the left and the center. Because liberals deplore tribalism, many of them, including this liberal, do not especially love writing about why they are liberals opposed to illiberals, post-liberals, and anti-liberals. So this is a confession that writing this, at least in some of its draft, pained me. Liberals do not like thinking of liberalism as any kind of tribe. Still, they are opposed to illiberals, post-liberals, and anti-liberals. They regret that some illiberals, post-liberals, and anti-liberals seem not to understand what liberalism actually is or characterize it in ways that render it unrecognizable. With Kahneman and Tversky, they say a, a refutation of a caricature can be not, no better than a caricature of a refutation. They also regret that some illiberals, post-liberals, and anti-liberals do know what liberalism is and are willing to respect freedom, deliberative democracy, and pluralism. Now we're gonna get, you're gonna hear a little more fire. Liberals think that many purported anti-liberals, anti including those at distinguished universities, are charlatans or snake oil salesmen. They think that some anti-liberals have manufactured an opponent and called it liberalism without sufficiently engaging with the liberal tradition in all its diversity or with actual liberal thinkers. They insist that some anti-liberals wrongly conflate liberalism with enthusiasm for greed, for the pursuit of self-interest, and for rejection of norms of self-restraint. Far from being charitable to those they deem to their, be their opponents, they describe liberalism in a way that no liberal could endorse or even recognize. Liberals suspect that some anti-liberals on the right and the left in Europe and North America, in Hungary and Russia and China, greatly enjoy being part of a large-scale moment 
and like movement and like seeing themselves as part of a vanguard without having or offering clarity or details on what their movement is for or against or what their movement would achieve it were, if it were successful. Liberalism is a wide tent. John Locke thought differently from Adam Smith and John Rawls disagreed fundamentally with John Stuart Mill. Kant, Constant, Smith, Mary Wollstonecraft, John Dewey, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, Ronald Dworkin, Robert Nozick, Susan Oaken, Doug Bernheim, and Jeremy Waldron are liberals, but they differ on fundamental matters. Some liberals like Hayek and Friedman emphasize the problems with centralized planning. Others like Rawls and Joseph Raz are not focused on questions, that question at all. It is possible to be a liberal and to agree with Hayek and thus to insist on the evils of socialism and the importance of free markets. It is possible to be a liberal and to agree with Rawls and thus to be open to some forms of what is sometimes called socialism. A liberal might think that Ronald Reagan was a great president and that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was an abomination. A liberal might think that Roosevelt was the great president and Reagan the abomination. Liberals have divergent views about negative liberty and positive liberty and whether there's a meaningful difference between them. Many, most liberals recognize these points and really don't like it when someone claims that one form of liberalism is liberal and that others are not. Most liberals really like it when Hayekians or Millians fiercely devoted to their form of liberalism agree that many liberals are not Hayekians and have serious reservations about Mill. Liberals the va value the width of their tent even as they disagree sharply with one another. Liberals do not believe that liberalism is a thing. They do not think that you can go in a time machine, seek out Hayek or Rawls, and claim that you have found liberalism. They insist that debates over the right understanding of liberalism are interpretive in Dworkin's sense. Those who defend their own understanding must fit liberalism. They cannot reject the idea of freedom or deplore Lincoln's sheet anchor or repudiate democracy. But liberals attempting to defend their own understanding must also seek to justify liberalism in the sense that they attempt to put it in the best constructive light or to make it as wor worthy as support as it can possibly be. A Rawlsian liberal should agree that a Hayekian liberal, liberal is a liberal and welcome Hayekians as such, and would only claim that Rawlsian liberalism is, in their view, superior to Hayekian liberalism. That's a good debate to have. I think I'm going to end with two notations, shall I? This is the peroration, the closing peroration. It's short. Um, what John Dewey said of the United States is also true of liberalism. Be the evils what they may, the experiment is not yet played out. The United States are not yet made. They are not a finished fact to be categorically assessed. In a document that launched modern conservatism, I think all around the world, and that is flowering in some ways now, William F. Buckley Jr famously said, I hope you all know this, famously said that his preferred form of conservatism, quote, stands athwart history, yelling, stop. Liberals ask history to explain its plans, and they are prepared to whisper, go. Thanks. Thanks so much. That's, um, that, was that was great, great as ever. ever. Um, now, now we've got half an hour. You can hand it over to questions, questions and comments from, from the floor. floor. I mean, I mean I've, I've I've got a few, but I'd rather hear other people's. people's. Maybe, maybe I could, could kick, kick off, off then. then. Um, there's there's lots, lots actually yeah, I could ask about, about this kind of thing. Um, but let me throw out something, something that I've been just, just because, because I'm sort of working on some sense, some of Amartya Sen's work at the moment. 
and, and there's, there's one, one there's, there's one big aspect of Sten's work that that, that that I struggle with, with a little bit, bit I think just in terms of you know, know what I think about it myself and, and I just wanted to see what you think about it that as well so I just throw it out there so, so, you know, know this, this whole idea of sort of in Sten, uh, he's sort of skeptical, skeptical of subjective welfare because of, of the issues around adaptation, you know, his happy slave scenario and all of that sort of stuff. Um, what, what would you say about, I mean, what would you say about that in the sense of being a liberal? Do you think it's, let me put it in more concrete terms, although it's a bit of an extreme example, I suppose. Um, in terms of the issue of adaptation, is, is that something that we should correct? So, so if, if a person, person is adapted, adapted to the state of, say, being enslaved and they're happy with that, you know, they're content with being a slave, they don't want to end their slavery. They could end it if they wanted to. The option's there for them, but they don't want to end it. Is that okay from a liberal, from your liberal perspective? Okay, so great. Thank you for that. There are some liberals who are see preferences as foundational and don't want to inquire into the uh, conditions that have led to, to the preferences that exist, just respect them. And there are others like San and Martha Nussbaum and Jan Elster who are very worried about the problem of adaptive preferences. I think the right conception of liberalism, not the only, but the right conception is, is I think San's right on that. And Tocqueville uh, phrased it, uh, you know, most vividly. He said, "Shall I call?" He's talking about slavery in the United States, and he said, "Shall I call it a blessing of God or a last malediction of His anger?" That disposition of humanity, which gives people a depraved taste for the cause of their own afflictions. And uh, um, bracket the question whether Tocqueville had slavery right and just take the theoretical point, which is, is it a blessing or is of God or a malediction of his anger that people form a taste for the cause of their afflictions? I say it's both. That's why Tocqueville's sentence is so great. It's a blessing because if you're deprived and you adapt to it and you don't uh, you know, beat your head against the wall, that's a blessing, but it's also... A, a form of unfreedom that your preferences are a product of deprivation that you face. And Mill, my hero Mill, uh, in the subjection of women is uh, extremely precise on this and says yeah. that an illiberal society, pro tanto illiberal with respect to gender, can create in women uh, preferences for deprivation. And that's... Um, uh, the, that's not respectful of agency. Okay, so, so you would come down, down on the side that we need to do something about adaptation, basically. Yes, what, what we need to do is a good question and to feel humble about our own claim that it's an adaptive preference rather than uh, an all things considered life plan. That's important. But the, the, right. but the theoretical point uh, Tocqueville and San Elster, I think, was there first in the modern era. His, his paper on sour grapes. Yeah. It, right. it, 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 if you, if I mean, there are cases, particular cases, where you could make it very clear. If you have someone who is uh, faced with extreme poverty and ill health and thinks that this is good or fair or something. The uh -huh. idea that, that person is free in the liberal sense, that person lacks a capacity for agency because of the background conditions. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Paul. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I, I think this follows on from the, the discussion we've just had. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the paper. Um, and my question really relates uh, to Sen's work, but this time to his notion of capabilities. So you write, and, and, and you just mentioned the liberal emphasis on agency. And my question is really, should it be or need it be capable agency in a Senian sense? And that's really prompted by two thoughts that I had while reading your paper. One was when you were talking about the American Constitution, and I was thinking of the work of Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom. Uh, and as you will know, they're adamant that constitutions are all well into the good, but people need the capabilities to engage in the art and science of governance, to borrow from Tocqueville again, the art and science of association. 
And, and the other thought that prompted this was you mention and extol the virtues rightly of Rawls's super uh, political liberalism. Uh, but I think in that book, if I remember rightly, he has a political conception of a person, someone who's capable, I use that word consciously, of engaging in public reason. And again, that pushed me towards thinking, for you, in your view of liberalism, is it a, a capable liberalism in that Senian sense? That's great. Yes, and I really am grateful for that. The uh, the capabilities approach. Let's let's have a uh, embrace a liberal embrace of it. That Sen is very um, insistent that capabilities are foundational to agency, and agency for him is central. He's very cautious about specifying what the capabilities are. Uh, his collaborator and uh, you know, uh, co-developer of the capabilities approach, Martha Nussbaum, is much more insistent on the specification, and she has a list of, of 10, um, being able to enjoy good health, being able to have a sense of play, she lists them all, uh, what she considers to be the important ones. I find that useful and good and convincing. Um, the scope of it and its cutting power are fair questions to ask. So in the UK and the United States, what kind of program does the capabilities approach inaugurate? A significant one, health, but it, it doesn't uh, go beyond some very basic stuff. Now, maybe that's good enough for a Thursday. Um, to say that, for, and you're making a nice link with democracy, which I think is compatible with both Sen and Nussbaum, that the uh, the democracy, deliberative democracy requires a, 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 an agentic citizenry. That seems right. Agreed. It fits with Lincoln. What I, I discovered the Lincoln passage relatively recently, it's staggering, I think, in its uh, boldness, that it says that uh, liberalism, I think, is a fair translation of what he's talking about, says it, it bans slavery for the same reason it calls for self-government. So that's a really good pun about self-government. And if you have someone who lacks capabilities, how can they govern themselves? It's a great point. I should do more with Sen and his family in the paper. It is, it is, it is really a central, central point, point, I think. It's, it's a shame, shame that, that Bob Sugden for all of you, yeah, Bob Sugden was on the line, but he's had to leave for another meeting uh, that he's had to attend Cambridge University. But he's got strong views about, about this, as, uh, as many of you know, that he believes that, um, well, he's, he's actually quite critical of, and the notion of strengthening agentic capabilities, as, as Paul might say, but uh, I won't put any more words into Bob's mouth since he's not here. He can he can talk about that at some point in the future. Uh, Sean, uh, Cass, I very much enjoyed the far too, so <laughs> that was great. I, I, I very much enjoyed the paper. I, I've got one, one slight observation, but a, a really, in a sense, substantive question. The, the slight observation is: I was a little surprised that you were claiming that utilitarians could be liberals, because there does seem to be quite enormous scope here for fundamental liberal principles to be transgressed with utilitarianism. And so, I, I was, but that's not really what I wanted to ask you. What I wanted to ask you is actually what position you take with respect to what's always regarded for liberals as a tricky issue with respect to who are the group of citizens to which these principles are being addressed in other words how far does how far do these rights that are liberal rights extend and I suppose concretely, I mean, one's always thinking about, you know, if we're to be guided by the harm principle, exactly how far are we guided by the harm principle? And it's in, in, in answering that, is it intrinsic to liberalism itself that one has an answer? Or, or do we have to necessarily have some adjunct set of other principles that are going to give us the answer to that question? Okay, so one note that I want to ask you a follow-up. So 
many liberals embrace the harm principle. Many don't. Sarah Conley, a really good philosopher, has a book on coercive paternalism. She's a liberal. I don't embrace the harm principle. Um, I'm drawn to it and kind of maybe 80% of the way there, but seatbelt laws are, are fine by me. So are compulsory, wear a helmet for driving a motorcycle. Uh, can, can you tell me what you mean by the, the scope question? Is, is well, it, it's, it, 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 as, I mean, supposing it wasn't the harm. I mean, the harm principle just crystallizes it if you happen to, because you have to then think about whose harms am I worrying about? Are they simply in my county, my uh, you know, city or the whole of the world? Or And so it's the, and in a way that, that just helps crystallize the question about whatever the principle is that one is, as it were, subscribing to, to who is it addressed? And often, you know, the recent debates have been where, have been around for liberals about exactly what you do about things like the notion of national boundaries, free movement of labor or not. And those seem to be important questions. And they are questions which are about who is the group of people to whom these liberal principles are supposed to apply. Okay, that's that's completely great. Okay, here, here's one that I'm actually writing a book about right now that puts your question in sharp relief. Suppose a nation is emitting greenhouse gases and it's trying to scale back through a carbon tax or regulation, um, should it deem the benefits of the scaling back to be to those within its borders, or should it take on board the uh, reduced harm to people all over the world? And this is a massively important question. And it might be thought of as a prisoner's dilemma, so you use the global number so as to establish a norm so that we don't have uh, massive losses because the prisoner's number isn't solved. That makes it too easy, I think, to your question. The question is what, what are the obligations? Um, this is a debate, I think, internal to liberalism. So let's welcome a number of comers. There are liberal nationalists who would say your obligations are those within your borders. In my view, and this is bears on your concerns about utilitarianism. If if we're to defend nationalism, it would either because it's just a pr practical thing. It's not ethical, but no one can be elected who says, "Hooray for Argentina!" If you were running for office in Canada, that you're going to treat Argentina with the same concern as Canada. Or there might be, I think this is more desperate than right, but we could try. There might be a rule utilitarian defense of nationalism where just as you say, if you people are particularly committed to their own kids and not to every kid, then kids will be better off. Something similar might be true for uh, concern for those within your national boundaries. I think this, we could sketch out the argument. I'm not aware that anyone has. And uh, whether it's true, question mark, question mark. Uh, in my view, the right position is that if a nation imposes harm on people in another nation, put to one side the pressing current question of foreign aid and uh, um, uh, I'll tell you why I'm smiling in a moment, foreign aid and military assistance. Uh, about an hour ago, my wife runs, runs USAID, and I was trying to get her attention, and um, she wouldn't talk to me, which isn't a very nice thing for a spouse to do, and she said, I'm busy. And I said, no, I really want to talk to you. It was about a work thing. And she said, I'm trying to do X, and I can't finish the sentence about X, but it was about what's happening in the Middle East. And um, and it was it was not it was not not about using American resources to help people who aren't in America. Did I phrase that? I know we're being recorded, so I use a double negative. So it was to baffle posterity. I think she was doing what was morally obligatory. Just didn't use the double negatives, right? <laughs> yes. um, John. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great, uh, well, great paper. I'm, I'm still trying to understand bits and pieces, but it's great. And I was, I had a couple of questions uh, reading uh, the paper. One 
is that one could see liberalism as an aspiration. So we, we all try to, well, some of us try to be liberals and we might not yet you know, be fully there or, or we might just see it as a, as a goal, as a sort of a meta ideology. So one could see liberalism uh, uh, consistent with other ideologies like socialism or green ideology or environmentalism, uh, uh, conservatism. So, so in, in a way, uh, one could think of of, uh, of uh, liberalism as liberal consensus. And I wonder whether you know that's what you had in mind: liberalism as liberal consensus. That's my first question. The second one, uh, I, I noticed that that you refer several times to the liberative uh, democracy and democracy in general as something that defines uh, liberalism and liberals. Um, but of course, uh, there's there's issues there around uh, collective rights, uh, so patriotism. So how how does um, your view of liberalism stand with with regards to those collective rights, patriotism? Um, is, is is there something beyond simply believing in the role of deliberative democracy there? Yeah. Those are the two questions. Thank you. Um... You could see liberalism as a set of aspirations to which no liberal nation lives up. That's fair. And if we, then we'd have to specify either what liberalism necessarily is or our preferred conception of liberalism and see it as a work in progress. And that my closing remarks were exactly about that. Also to see liberalism as to a large extent, something we're all uh, constructing rather than we're finding, I think is consistent with liberalism rightly understood, that it would be inconsistent with, I think, liberalism's, um, what's the right word, beauty, to say we're going to figure out what they thought in 1877 and, and just do that. So we're all constructing it, including I recognize, of course, all the names on this call, and in various ways, you are all constructing it, unless you're illiberal, and there are lots of illiberals. So one of the reasons, and I, I, I'll confess I'm thrilled that you haven't all hung up and said, why is he why is he given this paper? Why didn't he give a paper with an empirical find? Um, so thank you for that. Um, there, there are anti-liberals of multiple kinds, both you know, doing things in political life, and they're theorists. So Putinism is theorized. Um, Catholic anti-liberalism is theorized by some extremely influential people. Now, Catholicism, in my view, is highly compatible with liberalism. The word highly is too weak, but there is a form of etc. There's Jewish anti-liberalism, which you can, let's use another devil neg negative. Um, it is, well, we'll just say it's, it's not impossible to find that in Israel, Jewish anti-liberalism. And, you know, people believe it on principle. There's a guy named Hazoni, I think, who is written a great deal from the standpoint of the Jewish tradition, and liberalism is to him a bet noir. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Okay, there's that. Um, in terms of patriotism, there are forms of liberalism that are uh, the welcome patriotism. Let's say, you know, I'm lucky through Professor Reich's kindness and others to have a connection with Cambridge. And I, I feel, you know, I'm not a citizen of the UK, but I feel patriotic, so to speak. I did that before I had a connection. But to, to love your country and to have an affective connection with it, there's nothing illiberal about that. Um, it can turn illiberal. There are forms of patriotism that can turn illiberal. But there's nothing in liberalism that is you know, skeptical of, by its nature, of patriotism. I want to say another thing that some people, including some people on this call, uh, have a conception of liberalism that might be right. It's very important to say that that's not necessarily liberalism. It might be. But a Hayekian ought not to say that anti-Hayekians are illiberal. 
and a contractarian ought not to say that people who find contractarianism baffling are illiberal. Contractarianism is just one strand of the liberal tradition, and Rawls's own conception of contractarianism is so different from Locke's or Sugden's. It's just really different. But I think Rawls is kind of I think late Rawls might not hate what I'm about to say, early Rawls would. It's kind of a by the way contractarianism. It's not it's more it's more Kantian than that. But we're all among liberals, we may disagree intensely, but we're all friends here. And so one of the goals of the paper really is both to uh, identify that while also saying that friend enemy politics to liberalism, Carl Schmitt's view, and gosh, are we seeing that among theorists, uh, both explicitly and implicitly, liberals really uh, don't welcome that at all. It scares them. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, just briefly following on from that, you, you, you don't need my encouragement, but I'll offer it anyway. Um, there's a it's clause 30 or paragraph 36 where you write if the claim is that neoliberalism is a bad idea then liberals are likely to say we're not sure what neoliberalism is and i take it that that exemplifies in a way the point that you just made about not liking the friend identity and i really welcomed seeing that there i i've just finished reading bruce corwell and hans jörg klausinger's super biography of hayek or at least the first volume of it and one of the things that's really, really striking about that is when they're talking about the rise of the Mont Pelerin society and so on. One of the things that's so striking is how little agreement there was between people who are now lumped together as so-called neoliberals. There's a lack of agreement both on substantive commitments, but also on what the doctrine, whatever it was, that the revised version of classical liberalism would be. There was a enormous amount of disagreement. Hardly any of them use the term neoliberalism. Um, so uh, I was very um, glad to see that there, and I very much hope you'll 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 keep it in. I really thank you for that. I love that book, that the the, the big Hayek book. It's so great, and I hadn't connected that with this, and it's it's very. Um, clarifying that even among the founders, let's say, of modern whatever, I'm not sure even what the right turn is, but the movement that Hayek was a leader of, uh, Hayek and von Mises had very, very strong disagreements. And, you know, they were both Austrian, literally, and part of the Austrian defining of Austrian economics. So that, that's very important. The... Um, anti-neoliberal um, work I find exasperating for the reason you describe. And these aren't in in innocuously <laughs> exasperating because neoliberalism um, might be something we should celebrate rather than um, uh, scorn, depending on what the specification is. And if it turns out that there's a specification of neoliberalism that says, you know, the right conception of antitrust law is consumer welfare, maybe that's not right. It might not be right. I, I actually think it was right, but I have an adaptive preference because I was at Chicago for so long. So um, I think it's right, but maybe it's not right. And that's that's a good discussion to have. It is the idea that neoliberalism is incompatible with publicly funded health care. Hayek, I think, was ambiguous on that, and road to serfdom is, can easily be taken to be fine with that. So uh, I've, it'd be interesting to see a book called uh, Neoliberalism, a cel colon, a celebration. The fact that there isn't such a book is... Uh, instructive that it's more neoliberalism uh a uh, uh a repudiation which suggests that liberals aren't defending that thing they are defending a thing i mean from my i suppose you know listening to this seminar and you know from my readings generally um 
I, I think you sort of, you know, you, you, you highlight, highlight this, Cass, is, is that the, the, the terms have just become banded around all over the place to mean very, very different things. And sometimes the same terms are used to mean very different things. So, so when I, you know, when I read, um, the conclusion that I've reached is that the neoliberalism label or liberta and libertarianism, I consider those really to be almost the same thing, a sort of an extreme form of laissez-faire. Um, I suppose associated, you could go back to Herbert Simon, uh, for instance, or in a more modern day, maybe, maybe Friedman, Friedman, Milton Friedman is more closely aligned to that than than Hayek, I would say, but then Nozick maybe as well. And it's that form of liberalism, I think, which is almost like a, a very much a caricature of liberalism, classical liberalism, that's become associated in the common mind with liberalism, right? So what I've been trying to do in my own sort of very limited way, I suppose, um, is to try to rescue the labour of liberalism, because when you read Many of the classical liberals of, you know, the, the early, the late 19th, early 19th, late 18th century, early 19th century. And then some of the prominent figures that came out in the early 20th century as well, such as Hayek, I guess. You know, they're, they're very much, as you have you, as you intimated, you know, they're very much into state intervention in the right circumstances to address externalities, to provide some level of public goods that they consider a, you know, the private market cannot provide, and yet, you know, everybody needs them in order to live an autonomous life, really. Going back to Paul, Paul's notion of agentic capabilities. And social security nets as well, which is, kind of, you know, social security nets is very heavily emphasized by a lot of, lot of liberals. But it's so tremendously difficult to res rescue the firm. I'd just to give you a little example of why I think that's the case. In my own department here, the Department of Social Policy, for several, several years now, I've been trying to, in this limited circumstance, of trying to rescue the liberal name in these ways. And yet, many of them still come up to me and say, and believe that I believe in extreme laissez-faire intervention. I say, look, in many instances, I believe in more heavily, more heavy state interventions than you do. You know, so it's like, it's so, it's going to be so difficult, I think, to rescue these terms now that they've been out there so long and have been misused in these types of ways. Have you got any sort of response or reflections to that? I see Kristen has her hand up, so I'll just say very I'm sorry, Kristen, Kristen, did you want to come in? Sorry, I, sorry, I got carried away. Kristen. No, no, it, actually, I wasn't going to say anything, but Socrates got the best of me. And actually, it was because, Adam, you mentioned laissez-faire. I wanted to ask just a question to kind of tag into that, maybe, so they could go together. Is um, You mentioned, you know, kind of, the pushback from liberalism about focusing on a single entity of uh, of identity and you see a lot of policies that are don't mention maybe a single entity or the intention is very equitable by kind of not mention and don't mention the characteristics but i think we've seen recently very inequitable application so i kind of and i think this kind of goes sort of with the laissez-faire what I didn't know kind of your perspective, the liberal perspective on the focusing on a single entity of uh, an identity or individual in order to achieve equitable results and kind of that sort of conflict in there, um, which is, I think, that kind of desire for laissez-faire and leaving that with the practical sorry from the lawnmower um, results. So that's that's it. So I think that kind of ties together. So a little notation that Hayek was kind of uh, um, uh, very, very clear that laissez-faire was not what he was for. He said in no state could that could rationally be defended would the state do nothing. A well-functioning market system depends on a well-functioning state as much as any other kind. So what he was urging was that markets require property, contract, probably antitrust, tort, and you need an active state to have markets going. That was Hayek's claim. And so Hayek's uh, skepticism of laissez-faire was even a so-called laissez-faire state depends on an depends on a lot of government doing a lot of stuff. He also favored, consistent with Adam's point, other things. Um, uh, I'd say generally 12 years ago to insist that liberalism is 
uh, this and not that and worthy and honorable wasn't very important. It was kind of a semantic thing. Now it's really important because in academic circles, things have gone really haywire. And the Yeats's poem, the, the worst are full of passion and intensity. So, so it's, it's a moment very different from 12 years ago. Um, in terms of singling out some aspect of identity, if you say that someone whose legs don't work get resources or someone suffering from depression get mental health that help, that, that's not a problem. If you say that people who were under the age of two get some economic support with, with their parent and people who are over the age of 80, that that's not a problem. So state things that say, if you're under a certain age, you can't drive, or if you're over a certain age, you get some health subsidy. That's fine. The, there's a law in the United States called the Americans with Disabilities Act, which protects one group. Is it a mystery which group it protects? People with disabilities. That, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's probably required by justice. So uh, you could imagine something if a law said that only um, Presbyterians get 500 pounds on Saturday, that wouldn't be, that would be illicit discrimination. And if you single out people defined, let's say people of color get something, we should ask why. Why is it limited to them? And these are all completely fair questions. In the United States, our Supreme Court has imposed a rule of colorblindness. Uh, there are a lot of problems with that. It's not illiberal. You could go either way within the liberal tradition on that. Okay, okay, I think, I think we, we need to stop, stop today. today. Uh, we just, just past two o'clock. Thanks, Thanks very much, Cass. I think this is, uh, uh, as you've intimated there a moment ago, ago, I think it's an ongoing, ongoing discussion, discussion, isn't it? Uh, uh, liberalism, really. really. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so we'll, we, we, we may well have some more seminars on this topic. topic. Um, the, next the next seminar will be sometime in November. November. It will be on a Thursday, one till two o'clock, and Irina will send out a note to tell you when it is and who's speaking, etc. in due course. Thank, thank you very, very much for your comments to Cass today. today. Uh, and again, again thanks, thanks Cass for leading this seminar. I'll, I'll see, see you all soon. soon.